Aroha. Hey, how's it, brother? How are you? Aloha, how are you, Charlie? I'm doing fine, brother. I'm doing fine. I'm just checking everything on my controls here, make sure everything is working right. Yes. Looks like all systems are go. Hello, Michael, Lehua, Marlene, Susan, Roland Nita from Texas. Oh, hi, you, brother. Never miss, never miss, yep. never misses. Lina, Nani, don't forget all you folks that's coming on so far. Please share this broadcast. We appreciate it very, very much. Hello, Laurie, Angie, Bert, Omi. Wow, that's a good number. That's a good number. Very so what's good. happening, everybody? I know I get uh, Patsy's share party going on, and and um, she's got a ton of people. The only thing with the share party, they or the watch party, they don't get a chance to see our uh, comments but yeah we can create their own comments within the watch party right so, um, i try to monitor both but anyway thank you guys all for joining us tonight on this thursday night the kickoff of the nfl season the K kansas city chiefs whooped the texans tonight it was so nice to see uh football again live live football they did have they say about twenty thousand people in the stands so they allowed a, a very small percentage of the uh, thing. So it was it was it was just fun to watch. And my wife is sneezing Sorry. away Sorry. over here. Sorry. And it was interesting. They have these bracelets that they wear. Again, it's so amazing how professional sports they they go that extra mile. But so they got these bracelets. Everybody wears these bracelets, and it's GPS. And um, should someone test positive, they go back to those braces, the data, and they will be able to tell everyone that that positive person came in contact with, the length of time, the distance is just incredible, incredible. So mm -hmm. I guess it can be done. Oh, if yeah. you have the desire and you have the money, it can be done. Yep, yep. So why can't we do that with everybody? <laughs> well, you know, the, the the whole the whole thing behind it is if you have the if there's a will there's a way yep then if if the will is there but the way is hampered because of politics and money involved you know who makes money because really it's a money making item right because the person Absolutely. who's going to provide the technology you go you know everybody's going to be vying hey, let me get in on the action and you know, then then we're really losing sight of what this is all about. Yeah. When they start doing that, we really yeah. losing sight. I mean, it's it's crazy when you think about it. Yeah, we're struggling with contact tracing, and and there the technology is available. So imagine if everyone had that, um, and we had a positive case, and you would instantly know everyone that came in contact with you. Uh, unbelievable unbelievable so yes it does exist and uh we just choose not to use it that's all but anyway and you um, know so um, you mentioned one uh raylene yes the cares act money uh yep there's so many things that can be used but there are so many hurdles when you start tapping on that money accountability and it's for all the right reasons but sometimes it's it's so lengthy for something that may be, you know, again, you got to prioritize. Is it worth going through all of that? And uh, Mel and I would say, yeah, but there's others who have made loopy decisions might say, oh, no. So that's that's the whole gist of it is where is the happy medium, right? Where where do you where where do you find that that critical junction to make things work? And it's it's a tough call, tough call. You know, it's just hard to watch when you see that, you know, that it's being done for athletes and sports, but not for the general public. That's I think that's the frustration yep. I think that we all share. But yep. it is what it is. The game went on and we'll see. We'll see what happens. You know, I anticipate, um, you know, if they maintain their bubble, their little security bubbles, you know, we should be OK. But if if one or two or three of them decides to break the bubble and, and go out and have a have a couple of drinks or whatever it is, then you may see some breaches and then you'll see the numbers, the numbers rise. And, uh, 
but they'll have it all under control with their contact tracing. Incredible, incredible. But it was it was it was fun to watch football. I gotta say, it was, it was mm -hmm. fun. Uh, yeah, it's yep. there's no preseason. It's it's the first season opener game, and uh, we'll see how this thing pans out. Some stadiums won't be allowing any any visitors, any any uh, fans, and some will be like like Kansas City did tonight, uh, allowing just a percentage of the capacity so it's and uh, college will be doing the college will be doing the same thing it's white from florida thank you thanks for my shirts so i guess they got their shirts all the way from florida you know it's 1 a.m in florida se thank you so much for joining us and thank you for wearing that shirt and posting it on facebook Yes. Uh, I did get a chance. I talked to uh, my cousin, Raleen Wa'alani, so we had a nice little discussion about you. So hope all is well, and uh, thanks again for joining us tonight. Six hours ahead, man. Unbelievable. And you're and you're here. And you're yep. here. Hey, hey uh, I wanted to let you know, Mel, yeah. that, you know, I'm so saddened to hear of, you know, when, in, when we talk about our schools, you know, one of the biggest fears has always been about COVID in the schools. So we one had we had one at the uh, I guess it was last week the the middle schools at Dole, an employee and a, a student both tested positive, uh, both home isolation and today's news revealed that the employee from the school passed away from home isolation for COVID. I mean, you know, I'm just wondering not to not to sensationalize it, but. I always thought that once you're on the list, you're supposed to get contacted by DOH. They do follow-ups, right? You have like a someone assigned to you to do follow-ups, make sure, you know, how you feeling, how you doing. I hope that was taking place. But again, you know, we don't we don't know too much of the story other than uh, I'm just very, very sad and very sad and about that. Someone isolated. Well, it, it, it's very sad. Uh, Casey Wang, all the way from South Korea. Aloha, Casey. Um, yeah. You know, you know what was I? You, I read the I read the the article, and you know they they can't say. Yep. You know, Charlie, it goes back to what we were saying. It goes back to what we were saying about uh, letting people know you don't have to give them a name, and and you know, and this may come out really horrible, but you know when you uh, when you pass away, you you know you, you the the privacy goes. There, there is no reason why you should not be able to tell the people that, in fact, uh, that you don't have to name the person. You don't have to name it. You don't have to name the person. But mm -hmm. don't you think that the, the families of the of the kids and the staff of that school should know uh, if, in fact, one of their uh, employees uh, passed away because of COVID? I mean, you know, it just again, it just goes back to the transparency that we talk about almost every night. And um, it's sad. It is so sad. And of course, our prayers go out to to the families. Hey, how's your um, how's uh, how's Nikki? You know, Oregon. I, I understand that thing is raging. So she all right? Yeah, she's fine. Thanks for asking. Her and Baron actually in Beaverton are doing okay right now. In her her work area where she works in Oswego, Lake Oswego, uh, they're at a level one evacuation, which means that they're everything is. This is where she works, which is about a half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour away from where she lives. And um, they're at level one, probably will be level two shortly, uh, which, you know, she's, again, she's, they're, they're safe. They're safe. So thanks Good. for asking. Uh, Good. But we are, you know, we are keeping track on them and, uh, you know, and, and they're doing well. And I want to thank Diane Castillo from Vegas, who, you know, uh, messaged me today and, and said, you know, they have an extra room if if, uh, if Mickey needed to find a place she could go down to Vegas. I'm thinking I'm going to Vegas and use up that extra room for a little while. Well, folks, you know, today we had a lot of things happen. <laughs> but yeah, they're fine. They are. Yeah, look at this, Dallas, Texas. And oh. I mean, it, it's amazing. So we got a lot of people on. Uh, tonight we have... Um, um, <laughs> Dan, Dan Ross, Dan Ross, Dan, Dan Ross from Hawaii Nurses Association, and he'll be coming on in in a, in a minute or so. And we'll get to hear again firsthand from those that are on the front lines. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about what our nurses are experiencing and the challenges of uh, of being a nurse right now in the middle of a COVID nineteen pandemic. 
Yes. I'm yeah. kind of excited to hear what he has to say. And, uh, you yeah. know, um, I think going forward in the future, it will be good to bring back Dr. Mitskovich on and Dr. Akiona to give us an update on the senior, uh, the veterans home on the Big Island. That would be good to find out what's been happening there. And then uh, also with everything that's happening now, you know, bring the um, Lieutenant Governor back because there's so many things getting thrown in the, the hopper and uh, it's almost so much to try to keep track of. But again, folks, you know, we, we want to keep everything above board so we can bring the information to you, deliver it to you, whatever you want to keep, perfect. Whatever you don't want to keep, throw it on the side. But nevertheless, you, you folks are doing a bang up job when it comes to social distancing, wearing a mask, sanitizing, getting regular temperature checks, because that's the added one in some of these new uh, messaging. They add the temperature checks in there, which wasn't so, uh, which wasn't added on before, but it's now it's added. So social distancing, wearing a mask, uh, temperature checks, and, um, and sanitizing. So as long as we keep that going, we'll be safe. We'll be safe. We'll we got Illinois in the house, Jacqueline from Illinois. We got, uh, and I, if I miss some of you, I'm sorry. Uh, this thing scrolls pretty quickly. Kennewick, Washington. Yep. Ed, thank you for joining us. It's incredible. Um, people from all over the country. I want to say before, and I, I see uh, our guest is in the waiting room right now. Uh, I did want to say I got a letter from, uh, an email from Senator Keoho Kal Keoho. Kalole, yep. Today, and uh, he got a response from the governor. He sent me a copy of the letter, and the governor is actually contacted all the county mayors and actually will be entertaining that suggestion, and they will be they have committed to working with the Senate and um, our, our state uh, legislators on at least having that discussion on the inner island quarantine program that we talked about last night now i cannot say it was because of what you all commented last night but i will say this and i believe this with all my heart that i have no doubt that after they were reading the comments of the show last night look we already hit a hundred messages thank you guys um i'm sure it had some kind of influence on the governor rather than just you know uh throwing that that uh, letters away from from the senate and from from uh, a couple of the mayors no it, it was it was amazing and we thank the governor for at least uh making that commitment to take a look at this new protocol to deal with inner island quarantine not trans-pacific first so awesome thank you guys thank you yep. guys so we're working on getting uh, the senators on with a couple of the mayors to to have that discussion uh next week and uh, so stay tuned. We'll let you know as soon as we make that happen. So anyway, with that, unbelievable. We're going to bring in our guest right now. One, two, three, boom, unreal. There he is. Yep. <laughs> there he is, Mr. Daniel Ross. You like Daniel or you like Dan? Uh, Dan's good. Dan, okay. Either way. Dan Ross. Dan president of the Hawaii Nurses Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, sir. You've been a busy, busy, busy guy. I'm Mel, that's Charlie. Welcome to the show. Nice to meet yeah. you guys. Um, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, busy, that's a good word. <laughs> that's an understatement. Well, first of all, from our, uh, from Charlie and I, of course, and as well as uh, thousands and thousands of our viewers, we wanna say thank you for what you're doing. And we thank all of your nurses, uh, your frontline people that are out there doing what they gotta do to protect all of us. We just wanna say thank you so much and um, please convey, convey that to your members uh, when you get a chance. Thank you, you know, it's it takes everybody, right? Yeah, yeah correct. It does, I, I'm, you know, I'm expecting a uh, an eye-opening show tonight. You know, a lot of us, uh, we, we, we don't hear much uh, obviously everyone's busy. All nurses are busy taking care of people. I know for a fact that we have a lot of nurses on the show normally, because I have, I have personal friends that are nurses on Oahu that tune in every night. I'm assuming tonight we have more, uh, that saw the, the, the promo. So 
let's just start off and maybe introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what, what you do and what the Hawaii Nurses Association uh, does, and then we'll get into some the nitty gritty. Oh, sure. So, well, personally, um, I've been an RN for about 28 years at Queens in Honolulu. So I LPN and nurses aide before that. Uh, grew up in Honolulu, lived a little bit on the West Coast, worked on the West Coast as an LPN and a nurse's aide also, um, came back home. I've been involved in the union for about 10 years, um, started as a steward, got interested in negotiating our contracts, um, been president for two years now. Uh, and so, you know, in my view, the union work is a lot like nursing. It's, it's helping people. That's what we're trying to do is is get through this. Um, unfortunately, you know we're dealing with um, huge corporations, right? These are big companies, um, mostly the hospitals. And there's a lot of good people in there, but bottom line is they're about making money, and that's where we see the problem. Um, um, from our view, we see a lot of cases that um, safety is not put first. That, that worker safety is not put first. Especially when it comes to um, issuing of PPE in this latest pandemic that we're dealing with. Well, how, you know, how, how many members uh, do you have? We have yeah. about approximately four thousand members. The vast wow. majority of them are RNs, but we also represent respiratory therapists, radiation therapists, nurses aides, and LPNs. Um, we're on um, most of the islands. Most most of our members are on Oahu, but we do have members on the Big Island. On um, on Maui and and, and Kauai, and then there's a couple on um, a couple of the dialysis nurses that we represent are on Molokai. Well, let, let me ask you one one thing right out of the box. You know, we've been over. Well, let's start with the start of this pandemic. You know, they um, we saw real time how everything started to ramp up because in the beginning things were low. Uh, the lieutenant gov governor kept on giving us updates as far as, you know, how many ICU beds are available, how many ventilators, what percentages the hospitals were at. And then when things started to really kick into gear, which is like within the last two months, I guess, really got it got really bad. But, you know, there's always these reports from individuals and, and, and because we're not in the hospital field and you are. You know, we see, we read reports once in a while that, you know, some hospitals are laying off workers and this and that. From your membership uh, standpoint, what's really happening with that? Are are they laying off uh, workers? Some are. It, it, it's, it's crazy because nursing is, is specialized. Yeah. So there are areas where there are. So um, uh, we represent the nurse at uh, Rehabilitation Hospital Pacific. They laid off workers because they did not have the number of patients there. Um, going to the rehab anymore. People not needing the rehab because of uh, things just slowing down because of the shutdown. Um, so even within facilities like, say, a large hospital, Straub or, or Queens, um, their specialties. So where we're really busy on the med surge with the COVID and especially the ICUs, they get hit, hit the hardest. Nurses in the procedural areas like the operating rooms, the cath labs, their workload is decreased. So they're they're having their hours cut. Um, and we made the union, at least with Queens, Queens is our largest employer, uh, Hawaii Pacific Health, which which is Kapiolani, Straub, and Wilcox uh, that we represent. Um, that's our second largest employer. And that's a vast majority of our, of our members work at those two hospitals, those acute hospitals. And they're, their procedural nurses are not are not getting the hours. They're getting cut hours. At Queens, we made an agreement with management that look as things get bad on the floors, we'll pull those people out of the procedure and put them on the floors. Um, but you have to recognize that that's a different skill set, and so they're not going to be able to do there. There'll be an extra pair of hands, and they'll be will be grateful for it, but. It, it's hard for them, and it, and it's not like putting another ICU nurse or another med surge nurse on the on the floor. So so, where they, I know they have done it a couple of times at Queens that they haven't instituted very much to, to where they've been losing hours. Um, it, it it's kind of it's it's a strange, strange dichotomy where where we're overworked and then people are needing work at the same time. 
So with regards to the, the sensationalized report regarding uh, the Department of Human, I mean, uh, Department of Health uh, Services sending over these uh, these nursing, right? This federal program, right? Are are those that were sent over um, actually all specialized nursing that that was sent? Not all, over? not all. Some the ICU and med surge nurses. So I, I think the greatest need is an ICU nurses, and from what I I was speaking with the uh, Queens management couple hours ago, we had, had a meeting and asked them, so how's it working with, with them? And they said the ICU ones um, were pretty much able to get right in there and taking assignments and, and helping out. Um, with the med search, not quite as much. You know, you need an orientation. Every system is different. Um, and to, you, you can't just drop in someplace and, and be able to, mm -hmm. to be the maximum amount of help, right? Um, I know um, heard reports that so it's limited help. We're, we're grateful for it. It's taken some of the the load off the ICU nurses. Um, we're maybe give them a little bit of a break. It's taken some of the load off on the, on the COVID units at Queens. I think the majority of them went to Queens, right? Um, yeah. And really, I think uh, from what management tells me, what Queens is using them for is um, we're bringing in travel nurses. We're, okay, Queens has, has contracted with agency travel nurses. Bring them in. The union said yes we've got bring them in we want to help you know they're not members we're not going to get dues from them we're not going to represent them but bottom line is we want to help so we'll allow it it's like come on in um so that but it takes a while to for them to come in you set the contracts and all of that so this is a stop gap until those contract nurses um are able to help out and it you know i, I was talking earlier it's the the hard part is what we've been pushing for all along is we need to build our core of nurses here and not depend on other people to come in. We've got lots of new grad nurses that can't get jobs because we they build a bit. Oh, we got nursing shortage. Let's make all these nursing schools. They got lots of new grad nurses. I know new grads have to move to the mainland just to find a job um, because they can't get them as here. So we need to be training them up and stocking up and have a little bit of fat on the bone, a little bit of meat, extra meat on the bone, instead of as cost saving measures, hospitals want to staff to the bone. You need a little bit of padding for when things bad happen. So we've got the extra reserve to pull on because otherwise you don't have the nurses when you need them. Just so is, it, so is, it, is it likely moving forward, the union will look at all these new bodies to actually have them, instead of specializing uh, what you talked about earlier, maybe trying to have some of them specialize in, in a cross field. So should something run low, they can jump over and assist, or it doesn't work that way. Well, in limited degrees, it can work that way. And they, they have had, there are areas where you can, where people will talk cross train, the hospitals will encourage cross training. Um, it's a difficult thing to do because the, the work is so specialized to be able to go back and forth between two different um, specialties is is there's not a lot of people can do it. There's not a lot of need for it. So it's more having a reserve of um, what we've been trying to encourage me is build up the float pool. So the float pools are nurses that aren't assigned to one particular area. But it's kind of like you said, they cross train to many different areas, um, not the real specialties. They used to have an ICU float pool, they did away with it. We don't even have an ICU float pool now. And that's where the greatest need is, is in the ICU. One of the things that we had suggested management at Queens uh, took us up on it. We suggested at HPH also, but I don't think they um, they utilized it, was seeking out your nurses who used to work in ICU, who had moved on to other fields and giving them refresher courses and seeking out the nurses in the telemetry units who had an interest in it and giving them crash courses um, to be able to help out in the ICUs. Um, so I know Queens did do that where they gave them some training. And it, with the idea, um, you know, the union was in agreement with it in that they're not going to get a full on assignment. They're going to work with an experienced ICU nurse. It, it, you can't just take a course and step back into it. It's it, There's a lot more to it. 
So as far as capacity and as COVID patients are in all the hospitals, uh, do we have IC, I mean, uh, COVID beds in all, most, in all the hospitals? I'm not positive they're in all the hospitals. They're in most of the hospitals. Um, at this point, the majority would be at Queens. Um, Straub would probably have, Straub and Polymomi probably have their fair percentage. I, I know Hilo has, and North Hawaii Community Hospital and Big Island has, and of course, Maui, um, which we don't represent Maui Hospital, so I don't have firsthand, but I have some friends there um, that I talk to, so I get it from them. I get a second hand from them, what's going on over there. Um, so some of the smaller ones, last I had spoken to my people, my friends out at Kahuku Hospital, they didn't have any admitted. They have them come through their ER. You know, but, you know, because we have some very small hospitals in the state, right? And so they, they usually don't hold on to them. Typically end up at Queens or Straub. Yeah. Yes. Now, as far as capacity, are, are we seeing uh, more more pre-COVID versus COVID? Is is the workload greater now? Is it uh, are we seeing more patients now? Are we reaching? I guess the ICU capacities maybe uh, filling it's up. It's leveled off. It, it leveled off. So so we were shooting up there. It was getting bad. It was shooting up there. Um, so at Queens, maybe a week or so ago, um, we had a census, uh, the number of COVID patients in the hospital, over 100. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, I think today it was like 70. So it's, it's, it's leveled off remarkably. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, I, and I don't know much to attribute to either one. I think it's kind of soon for the shutdown on Oahu to have made that big of an impact on it, but it's probably had some impact on it. Um, and a bigger part of it, I believe, is they've changed based on CDC guidelines, which a lot of us um, are a little wary of nowadays. We don't have a lot of faith in the CDC guidelines anymore, but they changed um, how, you, how you determine when a patient is no longer infectious. Uh, with COVID, right? So it used to be you had to negative test. They're not doing that anymore. It's symptom based now. So it's um, 10 or 20 days, depending on how severe your disease was. If you needed intubation in IC, it was 20 days, if not um, 10 days. 10 days from the onset of symptoms, if you've been 24 hours without a fever and there's been some improvement in your symptoms. They, dis, they declare that you're no longer infectious and they don't classify you as COVID anymore. Um, and they move you off the COVID units. Um, and that has caused some consternation and some concern among our members. Um, there's been problems. They initially put them in semi-private rooms, sharing rooms. Um, when we brought that to management's attention, they acted on it and they, they changed it. Um, they you know, it's like, we said, What's this? we don't know for sure. We're it's unlikely they're infectious anymore. That's, that's, the, that's the words the infectious disease specialist use. It's unlikely. And I agree, it's probably, it's unlikely, but we don't know. So why would you put them in with somebody else if you didn't have to? And we're not at that point where we had to, we had private rooms. So, you know, when we took that argument to management, they they listened, they responded to it. And so we're getting it. Um, so I think that's part of one of the reasons why the numbers are down, because we're also, we're counting them different now. We're not counting them as, as positive. So, so there is no, there is no test uh, prior to uh, discharge. They're they're using the ten and twenty day standard. They, they pretty much, they pretty much adopted that. It used to be you had to have a negative test. Um, and last I heard, in order to the for the acute care hospitals to transfer out to the SNF hospitals, they still have to get a negative test. Um, but within the SNF hospitals, they'll use the ten day criteria to classify them as no longer, but they won't take them in there. They're being extra cautious, I suppose. Um, but, you know, right now when we have these outbreaks, so um, things are 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 bad at Ukiel Veterans Home on the Big Island, right? It's really bad over there right now. Um, at Maui Memorial, I hear it's getting bad again over there too. Um, I fully support Dr. Scott Miskovich's efforts. Um, I think uh, He's been a saving grace for our state. He's taken up the role that our government failed at. Um, and he set up, you know, some of our smaller facilities like Ukiyo, he's running it there, I believe, when I heard. Um, 
and it's still a mess there. Uh, but when you when you hit that point, you need to be getting up, masking up with the N95s with everybody who goes in the, in the building. You know, um, that's one of our big from the very beginning was our fight was to get N95s for the healthcare workers. Um, we still have that fight. We, we've come a long way on it, um, but we still have it in some areas uh, where we can't get it for, for everybody. Um, Queens moved a long way on it. Queens initially would not give them to us with COVID positive patients. Said you just use a procedure mask um, because it's droplet, not airborne. There's controversy on that, whether it's droplet or airborne. When you cough, you're aerosolized, it becomes airborne. So there's been improvement. Um, at, at Queens, <coughs> you now can get an N95 if you feel you need it. Now we have had incidences where certain managers held them back and then the members brought it to our attention and we bring it to management, the upper management to know they, they, if you can use your nursing judgment to decide when you, when you want to use the N95. Now there's certain times when you have to use it, which we're all with and, but we want to let people, um, you know, we've been trained in this, let us use our judgment when we think it's um, an appropriate precaution to use. And when it's widespread throughout a facility, as it is in uh, at Ukiel, and as I believe from, and I'm picking it third hand, I'm not there on Maui, um, at Maui Memorial, you should be getting it all the time and they're having a fight for it. Um, you know, one of the big things we had to fight about was the reuse of them. These are single use, so they're made for to be used once and tossed. That's what they're designed for. So because of the shortage, they got reused. You use one mask, for a week, you use one mask the whole shift. We used to used to be you would have one encounter with the patient, you would throw it away when you left the room. Go in the room, you get a new mask. That went out the window, and they go all day use one mask. Um, so they have the if you read the CDC guidelines, they have two two strategies on conserving, and one is uh, reuse, and the other is uh, extended use, where you wear one mask all day and you just don't take that thing off. And just leave it on because you're risking contamination or you take it off and on. Um, and then the reuse uh, would be where you put it aside or sanitize it. And there's different methods of sanitizing it, which are all kind of controversial and how well they work and how safe they are too. Um, and reuse it the next day or between the next patient encounter after it's been sanitized or sat for a few days depending where you're at. So every there's no consistency. So our biggest issue right now, as far as the the reuse and and extended use is at Kauai Pacific Health. Kauai Pacific Health, which is Straub, Kapiolani, Polymomi, and Wilcox. Um, Polymomi is non-union, so I'm not sure what's happening um, live in there, but uh, Straub gets the majority of their COVID patients. Uh, but they get, you know, you get moms coming into Kapiolani who are COVID positive. Right. So that's where that's where Kapiolani has seen seen the COVID positive patients coming in for other things such as pregnancy. Um, but what they do is they get one mask to use all day and then they have to reuse it. It gets sent to get um, zapped with UVs and it gets zapped um, up to five times. Now I've heard some some say three times, but most people tell me it's five times and it gets reused um, until it until it's been used six times or it doesn't fit anymore because sometimes the shake will go off and that's the most critical thing on it. There, none of these have been, were designed for that and we get it, these are emergency procedures and if, if you do not have any new ones, go ahead, do that, that's fine. It's better than using a surgical mask. We think that, that that's appropriate. But if there are new masks available, why are you, risking the health of the healthcare workers by not giving them a new one. You know, in the beginning, we, we said, um, we said to them, let us try to let, let them bring their own. If they've got their own enough time, let, oh, if, no, can't do that. We have adequate supplies. We don't want you to bring in any from the outside. If they have adequate supplies, why are they reusing? I don't think that's adequate supplies. Um, as far as I know, they're the only um, hospital that's still doing that process. Queens did it for a little while, but right now Queens, what they're doing is they're, um, they're 
the masks that are short supply, the 3M ones that are good ones that they that uh, are used for in surgery, surgery, they do take them and sanitize them, but they stockpile them. And I think that's the right thing to do. You stockpile them. If the need comes, you've got you've got a stockpile of ones that maybe not quite as good as brand new, but it's better than not an N95, a regular surgical mask, right? So that's the, from day one, that's been the biggest fight that we still got going on as far as the PPE. Um, and I think it's it's unconscionable that they still do that. Some of the things with that HPH, I really kind of get on my soapbox with them because um, other things they they don't they don't al allow um, accommodation for pregnant nurses. And so we recommend to our members if you're pregnant and you're not comfortable taking care of COVID because they don't know the effects, right? They say they get the high risk. If you're in high risk groups and it's moderate risk, they're not sure of the effects on pregnancy. There's been some studies that there are some effects on pregnancy can cause um, premature labor was one of the things. And there are, there are other things they just don't know. It's not around, has not been around long enough. So we asked is if they want an accommodation to say they get an alternative assignment instead of taking care of COVID, please accommodate that, you know, um, ask for volunteers to take care of the COVID patients first. They refuse. We've got nurses that ask for accommodation and they refuse to show you show us, even though the doctor recommended it, doctor's note recommended it. We recommend that they went, go down and file um, EEOC complaint on it, the Equal Rights Commission complaint let on me, it. Let I, me ask you something there, Dan. Um, so I don't want to get too, too off track on this, but you said when the reuse of the mask, especially when you're asked to use it all day. So again, as a lay person, I look at it is if the virus jumps on you, they tell you the thing will last for so many hours on your on, 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 on clothing, on surfaces, right? They they release those. But you know, nothing was ever said if I did one of these, if the, the virus would fly off and drop on something else. So likewise, if it's stuck on your mask, has anything been said that okay, if it's stuck on your mask, there is a probability or possibility that they can fall off your mask, especially if you had to leave a mask on all day. And you're hovering over a patient you know that kind of stuff we don't know as lay people can yeah. you i i don't think that that's likely because usually it's the the virus is carried on the droplets right so so right. tiny when you speak you know they say yeah, right. uh, speak it don't spray it right so there's different degrees every time when you speak there is spray coming out too and that's what the drop the the virus is carried on those on those droplets and the finer the product particles the further it floats in the air and it doesn't drop down. The heavy ones will go straight down to the ground. Um, but then the little mist like microscopic particles of moisture. So those will sit and they'll get stuck on the mask. The N95 masks, they're actually electrostatically charged. So it yeah. uh, sticks to it. So when it goes to it, and it sticks to it. So the danger with the contamination on an N95 is going is if you touch it. Uh, that's why you, the nurses have to be very careful not to touch it when they take it back off and not. You, um, you do your hand hygiene, you wear your gloves and do your hand hygiene. So every time between taking off a piece of equipment, you wash your hands. There's a whole process behind it. Um, so I don't think, I mean, I don't know if any of you study, but just on the logic, I don't think it's likely that it's going to fall off of a mask. It's going to go, it, it's kind of sticks to the elect electrostatic charge of a N95. But even on a surgical mask, you know, though it's not like the it has to be soaked before the water would fall off, right? It's right. Not, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Make, Dan, is there a shortage of masks in Hawaii? Is there a shortage of N95 masks that would would create this ridiculous standard of uh, reusing and? Depends uh, who you talk to. Um, I think well, they, are, they are hard to come by. They are hard. They are hard to come by. There was a shortage at, at one time. There's more coming in now. So I know Dr. Miskovic says he can get them for his staff, no problem. He, he, he's able to get them. Uh, I, I will have to say the hospitals were looking for alternative sources. So when this first came down and, and there was a big shortage, the union, I went out there and looked for, tried to get N95. I wanted to um, import N95 masks. I reached out to my international union, OKIU, based in New York, for help on it. Um, we jumped, they jumped in, and we bought masks. We ordered N95s from China, and it was such a nightmare. The Chinese government ended up 
uh, nationalizing the factory and taking over the order after we had got them. That they were actually manufactured and they got confiscated by the government. And so we had to go. And then we couldn't find N95s. So what we were able to do was um, get KN95s, which is the Chinese standard, which is slightly different um, than it. But they've got similar to the emergency use of, of sanitizing. They have emergency use where certain KN95s are allowed to be used for medical use. So we got ones that were on that list that were approved to be used. Um, while they're in transit here, the government says, wait, some of these are no good. And they took a bunch off the list. The ones we had bought, they took off the list. So it, you mean our government, it was the American government? American government, yes. Because today, some of these masks, we did some tests and these, these aren't, aren't working up to the standards, right? So. The company that we got them says, no, ours wasn't tested. They just took us off the list without testing. We got to go through, it's going to get back. So they replaced them with ones that are on list. So we ended up getting, in Hawaii, we, re, we imported um, uh, 50,000 can 95s Queens took 20,000 of them and HPH took 20,000 of them. And uh, the union held on to 10,000 of them. And we've been distributing them to our members where we see hot spots where there's need, where they weren't getting them, like say, um, we took them to Halenani and gave them to the nurses at Halenani, which is a nursing home that first had an outbreak. We took them to rehab. So we take them to places where the where the company is not giving you the N95s. Um, so a lot of places, and I get it with the smaller places, they give you the N95s if you're working with the COVID positive patients, but not if you're not working with those patients. So we're saying here, if you're uncomfortable because this facility has had an outbreak, use this if the company's gonna give you the n95 use their n95 it's better but if they're not here's a kn95 and and so we we did that to try to address a need and to try to alleviate some of the anxiety that the workers are feeling does the kn95 uh require the same fitting procedures like the n95 yes and and that was one of the good things about queens they will let me i've taken my kn95 Queens does the fit testing um, because they've tried to procure all these different masks. We used to just have like two, three different types of N95 masks. Now we probably got, I don't know, eight or nine different styles, including KN95s. Um, and so they, as we run out of one style, they want people to be able to fit multiple different ones. So you get fit testing and they let us use our own while you're in there. Say, oh, I want to fit test this one too. Because all as you put this plastic thing over your head and they spray the spray in there. You move around, you talk, and if you taste bitter, the mask leaked. If you don't, then the mask work. So it has that same, uh, it's just the, the standards are different. N95 is an American standard. KN95 is a right. Chinese standard. In Europe, they have another designation that they call it. I forget what it is, but it's a different standard. Um, it's just national standards. And if you look at the, um, the stats or the, the specifications, what the standards are, the the difference primarily is in the seal on the KN95 and the N95. They're a little bit more stringent on the N95. That's why N95s all have headbands that go completely around your head. And a lot of the KN95s are ear loops. Ear loops aren't as good. Mm -hmm. It's better than nothing, but they don't give you as good of a fit. Well, the, the patients, the COVID patients that are uh, obviously are not on, on a ventilator, are they required to wear a mask as well while they're in the hospital? How, how do, I mean, they, if they're suffering from respiratory problems, then I would assume they cannot wear a mask. But in general, so, do, are these, are these uh, patients wearing masks as well? Um, most of them are asked. So they're all asked to put it that way. So everyone who, every patient in, in, at Queens anyway is, is asked to wear a procedural mask when anyone else is in the room with them. Um, many of them don't, many of them it's because they, and it, it's, a, it's a big part of this psychological when you have something in your face and you have a hard time breathing, right? But so when we have all our gear on, um, most nurses are okay with it, but we, we do ask them to wear a mask. So if they're not um, compromised, unable to, to do it, we do ask them to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. I'm still, I'm still, I mean, I, I hate to go back in a discussion, but I'm still really uh, baffled by the fact that we don't have to test them before they leave. You know, we've had 
uh, guests from throughout the country. In fact, in South Korea and and uh, you know we we follow a lot of different countries as well. And it, it seems like that's kind of standard now. You know, you, you get a test before you you release. But and I, I, we do have someone from India tonight. Shah Ali Ahmad is on from India. But I. You know, I, I'm just hoping that that 10 day, 20 day deal is that. And again, I, I don't want to regurgitate that discussion. It just it's sticking in my head. Like, how? You no, know. It, it is concerning. And, and when we first heard about it, we were very concerned, too. And, and it's I, I get it. It's less likely. Um, but geez, you sure don't want to take chances with this kind of stuff. Right. Um, so I understand the, the concern. I, I'm you know, I, I'm not an infectious disease expert. So I. I and, well, look, you know, the problem, the problem I see when you start doing uh, an estimation is when the, 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 for, for us as a nurse or, you know, even a doctor to understand when a person's symptom manifests is how truthful is the patient telling you when it started? That's, that's, that's the big problem because that's going to determine how the thing floats forward, right? Yeah. It's very subjective, right? Right. So there's a, there's a lot of subjectivity in, in, in the whole thing. Um, the, the reason why they, they went to it, and I don't know if there's other tests that they can use, because there are a variety of different tests. The, the, what they consider the gold standard that they use in the hospitals is one that they refer to as tickling your brain, right? They go in with the nasal pharyngeal and they go way back. Yeah. It's like all the way back to your ear, through your nose. Um, and that test will show the DNA for months, possibly up to months after you had it. And they know that you're no longer active at that point. So it doesn't say when you don't have it anymore. You can still test positive long after you don't. So there, as far as I know, there's not a test of it readily available where they can say, okay, this guy is clear, he does not have it. So that's where they're going on. So, because they were doing that, te that, that test to clear them on the negative. And so there are people who would never clear or it would take forever there and it's a numbers game getting moving the patients out of the hospital it, you know that's the sad sad truth of it is we need the beds it's, they've got to move out and where where are we on uh you know without violating hipaa <laughs> what if as far as nurses and uh if, contracting the virus uh, is that is that a an issue i know we maui memorial my certain numbers is that is that becoming an issue and the, and obviously impacts the the capacity because when when these uh, nurses test positive they're out for for at least 14 days yeah so uh, and yeah what, so what, that is a definite what, issue i don't have numbers for you i don't i can't tell you how many um but i certain not every member contacts us when they experience it but they call they do call us sometimes and uh let us know and then we hear about where um, somebody they're doing contact testing right so at queens they had the outbreak it was when it was on the news oh nine nurse test positive for COVID at queens well no we had been having patients or nurses test positive all along queens why this was was nine at once in one place on the COVID unit that's what made that significant right um now all the employers want to push that you're not getting at work. You got it outside. And if you got it at work, you got it in a break room from your coworker. Um, we don't know that. There's no way they can prove that where that is. We don't know. They're like, so I've got a nurse just yesterday. One of my close friends was tested positive. Her employer, Straub, tells her, um, you had your PPE, so you didn't get it at work. You can't say that. PPE is not perfect. Um, and, you know, errors happen. It's, it's like you don't know where, where, where you contract it. it, it's, it that really upset me. The, the, this that is, one really this upset is me. What, this is what's happening. I know for years, like the fire department, right, they used to make it a, a gold standard. Uh, you know, they stay at the station 24 hours to play volleyball, right? Keep exercise fit. Mm -hmm. Well, what was happening is some some of them during their off-duty time will go do something and get hurt, but then come back to work and say that they got hurt playing volleyball and, and the thing. So nobody knew. But the, the thing about it that way is you can see when an injury occurs. With COVID, 
because it's invisible. It's that boogeyman that's floating around. So it's almost like uh it's almost like the burden of proof is being laid on you. Well, if you're gonna make the claim, like say for workers comp, you prove that you got it at work and not any place else. You know, they put the well, I think that's what the employer is trying to do. And that's yeah. that that's what they were trying to do. And they've been setting it, the storyline up all along that no, we're we give you the PP so you couldn't have got it here. Um, that's where they've been saying, even though we make you reuse your mask, right? Right. Um, that that's the storyline they're setting up. Now, my understanding of the work comp rules are the burden of proof is on the employer. So I advise every one of our members, if you test positive, you apply for work comp and let the employer prove that you did not get it at work. Um, right. Now, obviously, work comp, we'd rather you not be sick and, and you know, but it's better than than burning up all your sick leave or, or getting no pay whatsoever. Right. So it's not ideal but we think that they're setting it up for that argument um and like you said there's no way you can't prove you can't show that that no you had that prior we don't know where you contracted we don't there's no way of showing that um, right but we are exposed to it in the hospitals a lot more than you are anywhere else you know it's, it's I, there I think it'll be, and it'll be very hard i think for the employers to prove that it didn't come from uh the hospital or, or the clinic you know uh, lana hughes uh who stepped forward she's an old triple c sergeant that contracted covid she's actually on tonight and and she you know she very courageous woman and i gotta tell you you know i've i've been in touch with several nurses uh from throughout the state that are so afraid to step forward and, and tell the story of what's happening. Uh, Lana Lana did, and you know, the DPS, Department of Public Safety, same thing, denying all work comp claims from the inmates that were, I mean, uh, from the uh, employers, from the correctional officers that contracted the virus from OCCC, uh, all of their claims got denied as well. And, you know, it's, I don't know. I don't even know the word for that. Um, despicable or wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's just wrong. It's just plain simple wrong. I mean, These are people who are doing public service, right? The even the, the you know they're in they're in uh, life or death situations. Every every single nurse when they walk in the room, they walk down the hall, they walk into that hospital that has COVID patients face the risk of contracting that virus and possibly dying. And I think for the employer to come out, and this goes for O Triple C as well, for the employer to come out and downright deny it, uh, just as the policy, we're not even going to investigate. It's just no, uh, and then force the employee to go through the process, which you know is a very demanding process, very expensive process, could be. So, I, I think it's just wrong, um, and I think there's a special place in hell for those employers that do that. I really do. You know, I, I think I think if they wanted to, Mel, I, I, th I think this is it. And <laughs> I think Dan is bringing up a good point. If if the employer really wants to know if it was actually from work or not, they make it a policy every day when a nurse comes to work, they take a swab. And when you leave at the end of the shift, you take a swab and just let them pick up the costs for the reagents for testing every single day. And that way you be absolutely sure if they came to work with it or if they left work with it right because you, you're gonna you're gonna be absolutely sure but i don't I, I i don't hear the employer actually knocking on the union's door and says hey we want to test everybody no, going we to ask to be tested they refuse we've had multiple it's like um this is another thing that i was talking with dr miskovich about right and he helped us out um because we've had multiple members come to us who were exposed to a patient and the employer has a, a logarithm where they figure out if it's low risk, medium risk or high risk and oh, it's low risk. We don't need to test you. The nurses are freaked out. They say, I want to get tested. I got exposed. So, so, I mean, if to not be low risk, you have to have um, been closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes without a mask on or without eye protection, without mask and eye protection. And then have the N95, can just be a surgical mask and goggles or face shield. Um, so 
it, it, that's arbitrary, right? So where do you say that it's 15 minutes? And, you know, that if it was 50, 16 minutes, you're going to be high risk, but at 14 minutes, you're not, right? It, it's very arbitrary where they said it. So our thing was, why don't you test any nurse who asks for it? It's like, I think, and I agree with Dr. Miskovich, that everybody working in with direct patient care should get tested regularly. That's how you would control this from spreading in these institutions, right? Um, they won't do it. And I believe they don't want to know because there's a percentage of us that are um, asymptomatic positive. And they don't want to know because they're going to lose that many more nurses because they'll have to quarantine them until they, until they pass their, their period of incubation. Um, so what, when I was talking, when I was complaining about this one and, and um, Scott reached out to me, he offered so, and we sent it to all of our members. Un unfortunately, he's, he's just here on Oahu, um, so it didn't help our neighbor island um, members, um, but we can go to his clinic. Any, any nurse who works with patient care can go to um, his clinic and he will test you for free. He'll charge your insurance. If you don't have insurance, he'll just test you and you can get the test. Um, I went the other day because I may need to, my mom is um, in the hospital in the mainland, so I'm probably gonna be taking FMLA soon. And I wanna make sure I'm not positive before I go see my mother. Right. So I, I went and got tested at his clinic uh, yesterday. Well, Do Dr. Miskovich has been an angel for so many people. Uh, yeah. You know, even even at the old triple C situation, right on our show, he, he right there, boom. He said, we will make it happen. We'll go get a, all of the all the guards can come and get a test, you know. I, you know, I, I just don't get it. Um, wh why shouldn't the health why? department be doing that? Yeah, <laughs> right? Why doesn't take a private citizen, a private doctor, a good Samaritan to step up and do that? It, I mean, it's crazy. It's, well, the reason why, and I just found this out, is because they're on season two. They're filming season two at the Department of Health. That's why you need private citizens to step up to the plate. <laughs> yeah, I, you know it, it's uh i don't know i i just feel for it because you know we know we all know nurses we all know a lot of them and we we, we worry about them you know they're i you know i don't see the ceos of the hr managers walking through the halls of the hospitals uh the COVID wings uh you know they will never walk in those wings um they just wouldn't do it and that was uh, my argument early on when they were refusing us the N95s, right? So they were telling us, take care of COVID patients without N95s, just wear the little surgical mask um, and a face shield and you're fine. And you're getting up close and personal with these patients, right? You're, you get, these are very sick people and you're having to clean them up and things like that. The nurses, the nurses aides right in there with just their surgical mask. So it's like, let's get the CEO down here and you don't even have to clean the patient up. Just come to do some vital signs with that. PPE that you're doing. Um, obviously, they wouldn't. They didn't do it, uh, but it improved, and we got the. We do have the N95 now. You know, I wanted to point out another thing with with HPH. Initially, they were recycling the surgical masks too, the regular procedural masks that you wear, like the little blue ones, the, like mm -hmm. that. They were making the nurses reuse those and and zapping those with ultraviolets too, in the in the early days. Um, or oh, wow, it's like I don't even think the CDC condoned that one. Like they do do on the N95s, but just ridiculous measures to save money. The the N95s it costs a lot of money. You know the the it's supply and demand, right? The supply went up or the demand went up when the supply went down, and the price went way up on them. They can they can run between you know three and six bucks for one mask, and so. Say that's a significant savings for a company if they're reusing it all day for six days, right? Six uses out of it, and get them save them a lot of money. And unfortunately, I think that's what the motivation is. I really don't believe it's safety. Um, it's money. Well, Doctor Miskovich, I think on the first. The very first time he was on our show months and months and months ago and we asked it that was a question we asked because back then everything was we didn't have test kits we didn't have ppe we didn't have any of that and and he he at that point was saying you know there is absolutely no problem getting test kits there's absolutely no problem getting ppes you just have to pay for it you have to pay for it and he was able you know he was able to get 
his people have uh, get tests every week. His people get PP every day. Uh, and, and if you, I remember him saying this vividly. He said, if a lot of these hospitals are waiting for the handouts from from the CDC or for whoever the heck in the government provides the stuff. Uh, and if you're waiting for that, then you're not going to get it because it's, it was in yeah. high demand at the time. But if you went out and purchased it, uh, it was available. And that was months sure. ago. That was in the it's beginning true. of the pandemic. And you and look, when I, when I went to Dr. Miskovic's office to get, to get tested, so his crew's got the whole Tyvek suit and everything. So yeah. even when we got the full PP in the hospital, we got nothing like that. We got a little plastic apron, basically, you know, the, the gown that you wear, your back is open, your back is exposed, your lower legs are exposed. Uh, it, it, so, but he's gowning his people up like they do in the other countries. You know, you'll see the video like from in Italy and in Europe and in China where they're wearing full on Tyvek suits. Yeah. Oh, no, I got I mean, a cat fight going on. I wish they would they would uh, use him more, um, uh, more in a in a decision making role for the State Department of Health um, than than what they had. I really do because he, you know, now he's now he's a national expert, you know, and and um, we should we should learn from people like that. We should learn. Well, I, I don't think he um, he wasn't afraid of stepping on toes politically. So I think that's that was yeah. uh, where that's at because he's that's not what. It, my impression of the man, that's not his concern, right? And it's like, he's, he's interested in doing the right thing for the right reasons, uh, not political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, that's the thing. I think a lot of people want to place blame um, outside of Hawaii uh, and Washington, D.C. and everywhere else. And at the end of the day, you know, we can write our own future. We as a state, we as a governor, we as a Department of Health, I don't care what CDC says, we have our own medical experts like Dr. Miskovich, like yourself, like people that can come up and utilizing our own resources, making our own decisions of what we will do to keep our people safe. I don't care what others in other places are doing or not doing. You know, we 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 can we can dictate the safety of our employees and our residents uh, by making tough decisions. That's just we just didn't do it uh, from early on. And we, we took the easy way out. Senator Kahele is on. Um, uh, Dan, there's a lot of our legislators watch the show. They either on live or they come on afterwards. And I know as we're getting close to the hour, um, what what would you what would you tell them? I mean, I know you've spoken to many of them. I know you're in constant uh, discussions with with state leaders. But what would you what what would be your wish? What would be your ask if uh, you had everybody's ear? for your nurses. Yeah, you know, um, I think it just comes down to doing the right thing and being prepared. Um, so we, we got caught with our pants down, right? It's like I said in the beginning of this um, on an inter interview, we were let down by our employers and we were let down by our government. Um, they, we didn't have the trained personnel and we did not have the supplies. So we got in a bad situation, it got better, but we need to build those up. So get stockpiles getting more, more of the safety equipment and get the trained personnel. Train up more personnel and keep a reserve of them. It will be expensive. It's going to cost them money, but the, I think it's well worth it. You know, it's like um, there, there's a middle ground there, right? You don't want too much fat on the bone, but you, you need to have a little bit of a cushion for when bad things happen. Um, we need to keep more people higher up our new grad nurses. As far as, you know, my, my focus is on nurses. We represent other specialties too, but primarily nurses. And they need the experience. We need the new generation to give them jobs to replace them. You know, I'm almost 60 years old. I'm not going to be nursing that much longer. Um, we need the, the new ones coming in to get the jobs and get trained so that when the older ones step out, they're already trained to take over. That, that's that's it. And I don't know where, you know, with the state legislature, um, how that much influence they have. And that, that's their, our employers, right? So, you know, the things that we're going to push for through the legislature, um, we want staffing legislation. Then they have to hire the nurses. We want to because right now we don't have that. We want ma no mandatory overtime legislation. Th those are our key legislative issues. 
we want staffing ratios like they have in California um, laws, uh, where you have minimum. You cannot have fewer. You cannot have more patients than a certain number uh, based on acuity. Um, that no mandatory um, protections um, for healthcare workers are assaulted. Some legislation was passed not too long ago on that. That that needs to be toughened up. You know, th those are the legislative things that that. From our perspective, that's kind of our legislative agenda as the nurses union is getting those those three issues set. And we've been we're we're working with some of the other unions on how we can um, combine our, our forces on things. Uh, so we're looking at there's a bill that that we're going to try to get sponsored on protections not just for for nurses but um, all first responders or essential workers who. Um, uh, face, you know, because you have these crazies out there who are anti-masks and that, uh, and, you know, we've seen people assaulted for trying to enforce, don't come in the store if you don't have a mask, things like that. So we're supporting those sort of legislative actions along with some other unions. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, going forward, uh, Dan, uh, and this, this is just, again, I always try to come from a, a layman's point of view. I mean, uh, you know, I said this before, and I, I used to work at the ME's office. I was a death investigator with Honolulu, mm -hmm. and and I remember, and I, you know, I I, I talked about uh, Dr. Libby Char, who's the interim uh, director at the DOH, and I remember back then, you know, we we talked about planning for, especially the the, the, the bio ter terrorism. You know, we we were planning, mm -hmm. and I said it, it kind of be it kind of um, baffled me to think that we did such extensive planning, knowing that if something was unleashed on Hawaii or Oahu, Honolulu, because we're an island, right? We're not, mm -hmm. we can't drive to the next state sure. over. We, we're, we're sort of like, we're sort of like the mercy, the mercy ships, you know, we're self-contained, here we are. And it, and it just, it just baffled me to think that when, when all of this was going down, there wasn't enough equipment. I said, we prepared for that. We talked about it. You know, we talked with the military. They, they basically said, what is needed, how much supplies would be needed, especially for emergency staff, uh, victims, the, the whole likes. And just some, some way through the cracks, something fell, something fell through the cracks and you ended up short. So I, I know you said we get caught with our pants down, but the truth of the matter is no, they knew it was coming. It's just that who's ever pants got caught down is that the one that's falling asleep behind the wheel because this- That's right. Yeah, this happened. You know, I, I wrote letters to all of the employers, all of the employers that we have for them, asking them back in January, what are you doing to prepare prepare if this pandemic hits Hawaii? This before it came to us. Silence. They they ignored me. They to me that meant they weren't doing anything. And none of them. Queens yeah. included, you know, because they ignored it. It's until the cases started to come, then they started talking to us a little bit. Right. Well, you know, we got someone that asked, I think you answered the question, you know, what kind of access to testing with nurses like Daniel Ross? How often do you want your staff to be tested regularly? I mean, there, there, there's the answer right there, regularly. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be, that'll so, be the best thing. And I, I don't know the, the, the science behind how what's the, the best. I asked Dr. Miskovich and um, Dan's me it was every nine days. So every every week or two, about every nine days, should get tested. Um, so I'll defer to to him on that one. Well, you know, we got the incubation period, right? They tell you about the ten day window, right? Yeah. Well, so if it's a ten day window, they get tested every ten days. Be safe that way. <laughs> we, we don't throw off that so, Right. You know, um, and and it probably is. You know, like they said, I think at UQ, they said the, they think that it, it got in there because one worker was asymptomatic positive. Didn't know it. You know, I'm sure that person feels horrible. Yeah. Right. It's like they, because they're not tested. So how are they going to know? How are they well, going to know when they go in there? I think when we brought him on, I think Mel asked a question about, okay, you know, and like you said, the person's asymptomatic, but the question was asked. Knowing that you had Halinani, knowing that you had Pro City Nursing Home, so it's not like it just sprung up on them. The, so the question was asked to Dr. Miskovich, "Do you think they had a plan to deal with it? Should it happen?" And his answer was, "No." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and we, we, we represent them. 
the nurses there too at UQ. There, there are members, um, and it, it's still like I say, it's better. We're, we're, we're really happy that they, that they take in Dr. Miskovich's advice there. You know that they're doing it, um, but there's, they got a long ways to go. You know, it's a bad situation there. They need to, they really need to crack down on it. Well, it's hard because you got resources. You know, you 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 test positive, you're out. Your uh, your level one contacts are, are out because they got to wait for your test to come back, and and they more than likely will get tested, and they got to wait. You get another positive. That's another fourteen days of, of man hours that you don't have. It's a tough tough thing, and we don't have the so what, the backup. So one of the things that, and, I, and I'm sure it's kind of just a drop in a bucket for them, but we have our members. So they're they have the same parent company as Halinani. You know, they're both owned right. by Avalon. Um, right. We have members from Avalon volunteering. Mm -hmm. a big island. Well, this is what kind of stunned me, and I, I posed a question the other night. If you saw the spokesperson for Avalon make the statement, pretty much saying that you know they weren't prepared when she, when she came when she came on air, um, I, I I would have thought you know given you know how many deaths have occurred. How many? I mean, 63 out of 74 patients already infected. I would have thought, you know, best you don't say anything. Just you, you don't want to say something like that. That you're, that you know, there, there's no protocol in place. I mean, it's. I just saw dollar signs going. Oh, bing, bing, bing. I said, uh oh, here it goes. So. Yeah, I, I don't really have. And you know, they, and they have protocols um, because that they're a big corporation. Avalon, they're in the mainland. It's a big corporation. It's it's, it's not. A little small outfit, you know, Hawaii only outfit. They're a big mainland corporation. Um, as I spoke with the, at Halinani with the director of nursing, they had theirs. Um, and it's like, yeah, they're getting their instructions from corporate, right? And since they've dealt with this, they, they've had this before in the mainland, in their facilities in the mainland, so they know what they're doing. I'm like, oh, that's great. So follow their advice. So why wasn't Ukiel getting it? Um, and I think our members there brought up a lot of concerns. They have concerns about the air handling system there. I believe it's an older building, right? Um, and that's that's one of the big things you want air exchange, right? Um, you know, there's talk of negative pressure rooms. Th those went out the window in the early days. We don't have enough negative pressure rooms. We don't have, that's where the air only goes into the room, not out of the room. Um, so what they say, what you want is, what you want to avoid is when air just sits there stagnant. That's for the droplets, and that's when you get the higher contagion. You want the air to exchange out, you know, so open windows, breeze blowing through, that sort of thing. Well, uh, you know, we hope we hope we all get through this soon. I mean, it's been a long run, and it, it doesn't seem like it's going to go away anytime soon. But uh, we hope that no. uh, the, the the right people hear your your pleas and, and start doing uh, doing the right thing for our nurses. You know, we. We talk about our nurses uh, often. We we, um, we we had a discussion about you know how much we appreciate what they do for us. Uh, the the true unsung unsung heroes. You know, I'd never be a nurse. I'm telling you right now, I don't care what they pay. I just never do it. I, I couldn't. I just not built that way. And um, and these guys, these people go in every day, in and out, working with uh, with people that are are sick or hurt. Uh, and again, I've had many heartfelt discussions with nurses that are, are basically pleading for help mm -hmm. and just not getting the help that they, they need. And it's frustrating. And that is um, the, that's the biggest frustration. You're trying to help and that you're, you get stonewalled. Right. Um, and it does take a special person to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a job for anybody. You know, there's a lot of jobs like that. Right. Um, but, but it, it's, it's not it's not everyone can do it it's not an easy job um it's a rewarding job but it's it's a difficult job it's psychologically difficult and it's physically diff difficult and when you don't get support from your employers and from your 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 government at times right you know the government was not prepared i think our government on all levels failed in this miserably uh, that's where you know thank god for people like like um dr miskovich you know i've mentioned his name so many times i honestly I, it's not like i've got a crush on him or anything it may sound like it because i've brought him up so many times but it, i really do admire the selflessness 
that he's got that he's out there putting himself out there um, doing the work for it and and getting things done you know taking care of the business basically and he does I have thank you for the platform he does have the reach he does have the traction and and uh, he's doing a great job so um, yeah. thanks again charlie any closing comments for uh mr ross here well you know i am so grateful dan for you to be on tonight uh it was uh, a long time waiting we tried to get other nurses but we knew about that fear factor and I'm glad that, you know, you being in a position, you, you know, you can, you can talk because you represent them. And I think uh, part of the reason. A little protection. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, one of the things that we've always said is that the people, our viewers, you know, people that join in, they, they because our, our whole premise is to educate and inform, inform and educate. But having you on just to get the message out so they can see firsthand, hey, you know, here's somebody in the trenches. And we have some people that's been on that I, I know they're nurses as well, just by the dialogue that they're holding. Uh, you know, to have you on here, I just, I, I can't thank you enough. And I, I appreciate it. And I hope all the best. And, you know, some are asking, how can we help our nurses? So, you know, if you have any ideas, like, you know, if we got to write to somebody or, you know, because we just got to keep on turning up the pressure. Because if not, there's going to come a point in time. And, you know, both Mel and I, we're both retired coppers. We know that. Sometimes you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them because you're going to get to that point that you're going to be good to no one if you're if you're just mush. And I yeah. think, you know, we, we need to get you. We need to get the nurses the help they need, really. So thank, thank you. you. Thank uh, well, thank, thank you guys very much for the platform. Um, you know, I've been I, that has been one of my main goals is getting the word out. Right. It's like I've got a. I, I've got a little mantle of protection being the union president. I can, I can say these things where they're not going to fire me for, for it. I hope, <laughs> right. but, um, it, it's, it's just get the word out what people can do. Um, you know, and, and it's cliche, but the, the masking and staying at home stuff, it does make a difference. Yes. You know, I think it makes a difference in numbers down. It's like, um, you know, just just stick with it. I know it's it's hard. I'm living through it. It's I, I'm sick of dealing with the COVID stuff too. I got a sick mother in the mainland. I got to go help. Um, you know, and it's like I got to worry about quarantine and all this stuff. Nobody, it, it's it's rough, but it does make a difference to follow these things. The numbers, it, it's surprising how you see the reflection in the numbers of people in the hospital. It really is. So, so that's what the normal average person can do. And I'm from law enforcement, so my dad's retired cop too. All right. Well, you know, I, I, I think we, uh, we, we say it enough times about wearing a mask. We talk about the social distancing. We, we basically talk, talk about that so many times. We think we're repeating ourselves. And I think for the most part, people listen. But, you know, today I'm driving down Rice Street, a bunch of knuckleheads again uh, in front of the county building protesting without their masks, without social distancing. Um, you know, it just, it just pisses me off to see that because very we, know, yeah. we know, and I'll tell you a quick story. I got a call from a nurse from Honolulu and I saw her name on tonight. So if, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to mention names, but, you know, she calls me up and she's, she's so emotional because at she she she's seen death. This is when the numbers were out of control, when the capacity, when people were being transferred out of Queens uh, to other hospitals, and she's driving home after a, a, a gotta be a, a rotten day, and passing the bars uh, or the the restaurant bars on Oahu that were open at the time, and people out, no masks, having a jolly old time, uh, no social distancing. And I, you know, I, I could only feel for that, that nurse uh, thinking, you know, all the work that they do to keep our people safe, keep them alive. And you get these bunch of idiots that don't give a damn about anybody else. They have absolutely no respect for no one that that creates more problems. Uh, you know, my heart just goes out to all of the nurses that do this day in and day out and still on their way home. Got to watch the knuckleheads as they, as they cannot do a simple thing like wear a mask. So thank you, uh, Dan. Thank you. Thank all your nurses for us. And listen, any 
anytime you uh, need to get the word out on anything, you need some help, you need some community support, just let us know. We'll get you back right on the show. And, and uh, you, you, this platform is yours to you, my friend, to help the nurses anytime you, you need them. Thank you, brothers. I really appreciate it. All right, man. Okay, it's been a great service. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. And don't forget, guys, let's uh, pray for our nurses tonight. Let's pray for our uh, healthcare workers, frontline people. Pray for Dan. Poor guy, he needs it. He's, he's leading the charge. We'll see you guys tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. We love you guys. God bless. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks, bro. Thank you.